You can now get a 30-day trial to experience The Athletic for free. Visit the link in the description below to try it now. Some sports are consistently linked with doping. In fact, almost all sports in all countries have had issues around performance-enhancing drugs, and yet the belief persists that football, according to players, administrators and many fans, is entirely clean. The former FIFA president Sepp Blatter once said, Footballers have absolutely nothing to gain from taking drugs because, in contrast to other sports, they need a vast array of qualities and skills to succeed in the game, such as strength, endurance, speed, intelligence, tactical understanding, and ball control. And Gordon Taylor, the longtime CEO of the English Players' Union, once said, I'm almost certain that we have a clean sheet over performance enhancing drugs. Now, is that really true? Well, it's unlikely. There's actually a substantial list of well-known players who have faced drug allegations, and a few have even been handed suspensions, fines or prison sentences for either being caught with banned performance-enhancing drugs in their urine or blood, or for breaking other WADA anti-doping rules. Pep Guardiola actually twice tested positive for Nandrolone as a player in Italy, receiving a four-month ban, a seven-month suspended prison sentence, and a €9,000 fine. Over six years, Guardiola used a defense of contamination, which wasn't accepted, and that he had a medical condition causing the anomalous result, which was initially not accepted until that decision was reversed on a technicality, a decision Italy's anti-doping authorities disagreed with. In 2009, a year in which he had a late career comeback trial with Tottenham, goalkeeper Magnus Hedman had his car raided in Stockholm and a police blood test came back positive for Stanozolol the anabolic steroid made infamous by Ben Johnson at the 1988 Olympics. He was fined. Abel Xavier, who played for Liverpool, Everton and the Portuguese national team, served an 18-month ban after he tested positive for the anabolic steroid Dianabol in 2005. Former Manchester United and AC Milan centre-half Yap Stam served a four-month ban for testing positive for the banned steroid Nandrolone, as did another legendary Dutch player, Edgar Davids. Christophe Dugary, formerly of Barcelona, Marseille and Milan, faced a six-month ban for Nandrolone after a positive test. Dugary maintained his innocence, and a procedural error meant that the charges were dropped, after it was shown that the doctor who administered his test was not qualified to do so. And Samir Nasri is another famous case. He got an 18-month ban after he had a 500 milliliter drip infusion of water and micronutrients at an LA clinic in 2016, which is 10 times the amount allowed under the WADA code. And Manchester United midfielder Fred served a one-year ban after testing positive in 2015 for a banned diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide, commonly used as a masking agent. So it's nonsense, therefore, to claim that banned performance-enhancing drugs are not used in football. Nor is doping in the game even new or relatively new. A 2008 paper published in the Journal of Soccer and Society by academics from Loughborough University and the Norwegian School of Sports Science cited cases among many of Arsenal using pep pills in the 1920s, Stanley Matthews using amphetamines in 1946, Manchester United's Albert Scanlon and Harry Gregg using amphetamines in the 1950s, and the British government in 1963 having the gravest doping concerns in cycling, athletics and football. So doping does occur in football, and contrary to what Sepp Blatter claimed, it can create many advantages. So, drugs that fall under the anabolic steroid umbrella include stenozolol, nandrolone and methandionone, the latter commonly sold under the brand name Dianabol. In broad terms, steroids help to increase muscle mass, reduce body fat, and increase recovery time after injury. Steroids can improve an athlete's ability to train harder, aid recovery by reducing fatigue, and help the body build muscle by producing more protein. Their performance-enhancing properties are therefore applicable across almost all sports, football included. The family of banned stimulants, which can improve focus and alertness, include ephedrine and amphetamines. Many beta-2 agonists, meanwhile, such as hegenamine, are banned by WADA because they help with the dilation of bronchial passages, or in layman's terms, they ease stressful breathing. If you have asthma, you'll probably use a beta-2 agonist, such as salbutamol, in your inhaler. You may be surprised how many elite athletes, especially cyclists, need this asthma treatment. Masking agents and infusions above certain levels are banned for obvious reasons. 
They can mask the usage of banned performance drugs. IV infusions are included on WADA's prohibited list because some athletes could use this prohibited method either to enhance their performance by increasing plasma volume levels or mask the use of prohibited substances. And last but not least, among the most common banned drugs and procedures are blood boosters, also known as blood doping agents, which abnormally increase the oxygen-carrying capacity of blood. They are commonly used in endurance sports such as race walking and biathlon, and in sports where high tempo activity needs to be sustained over an extended period. Erythropoietin, or EPO, is the best known drug in this category, and ubiquitous in cycling by the late 1990s, and well into the noughties. Italian football was particularly plagued with doping allegations. In 1998, a French doctor living in Italy, Giro Molza, told the Gazzetta della Sport that he had given EPO to unnamed Serie A footballers. In the same year, the manager of Roma, Zdenek Zeman, publicly questioned the physical development of some Juventus players, implying steroid use. Local government officials started a nationwide inquiry, and when they raided Juventus, they found 281 pharmaceutical products. The club and players have always denied any wrongdoing. In 2004, charges were brought against Chief Executive Antonio Girado and club doctor Ricardo Agricola. Girado was acquitted on the charge of sporting fraud, while Agricola was initially given a suspended prison sentence for supplying performance-enhancing drugs, including EPO, but he was later cleared on appeal. And the scandal wasn't confined to Juventus, though. Documents found during a search of an anti-doping lab in Rome, which handled samples from across the country, suggested how unreliable Italy's testing system was when they showed urine of footballers had not been tested for steroids and that other test results had disappeared. In 2004, a leading haematologist, Dr. Giuseppe Donofrio, testified in court that he was practically certain that Antonio Conte, a Juve player from 1991 to 2004, had used EPO when at Juventus with the stated reason it was medication for anemia. Conte has a clean sheet when it comes to doping, but he has revealed that he took antidepressants during his time at Juventus and that he used an IV drip containing what he was told were vitamins. And of course, English football wasn't immune from the problem either. That same year, 2004, the then-manager of Arsenal, Arsene Wenger, said that internal club testing of player blood samples indicated that some players joining Arsenal from abroad had displayed symptoms of prior EPO use. In particular, that their red blood cell count had been abnormally high. That kind of thing makes you wonder. Wenger claimed, there are clubs who dope players without players knowing. The club might say that they were being injected with vitamins, and the player would not know that it was something different. So, fast forward more than a decade to 2016, and a former footballer turned academic, a German-Moroccan named Lufti Elbosidi, published research findings based on interviews with players. Elbosidi's career began in the Mainz reserves in the late 1990s and ended in Spain's third tier in 2010. Several times he was given supplements or IV treatments not knowing what they contained, and he was only ever drug tested once in his career all of which made him curious about drugs in football when writing his thesis. He had 124 responses from footballer contacts he knew personally across Germany, Spain and Sweden and concluded that between 14 and 30% of players had doped in the previous year, with the rates lowest in Sweden and highest in Germany and Spain. While Elbasidi's sample size was small, his methodology, encrypting answers to maintain anonymity, is accepted as a valid way to encourage honesty. More than 43% of respondents said that they had not been tested in the previous year, and a further 50% said that they had just one test. The reality is that only a tiny minority of footballers face anything like what might be called regular testing. There are approximately 140,000 professional footballers in the world, and about 40,000 drug tests in football worldwide per year, not all in the professional game. So on average, roughly and globally, a footballer gets tested once every three and a half years. And given that traditional testing is not particularly effective, with at best one in ten dopers being caught, we can surmise that a lot of footballers who take drugs are getting away with it. There are also countries where national anti-doping agencies have been shown to be ineffective and in some cases, cheats themselves. This was true for years in Russia, where the corrupt lab boss turned whistleblower, Grigory Rochenkov, was pivotal in helping thousands of athletes across dozens of sports to either cheat and or have failed drug tests covered up. 
Also deeply involved was Russia's anti-doping agency, Rusada, and Russia's sports ministry, headed by Vitaly Mukko, who was also the head of Russia's FA. In 2017, a year before Russia hosted the World Cup, it was revealed that a cache of documents taken to the USA by Rochenkov when he fled Russia in fear of his life showed Russia's 23-man 2014 World Cup squad were in effect guaranteed never to be caught for doping inside Russia. Then, during the 2018 World Cup, names of Russian internationals who had failed doping tests but not been punished emerged. And in an interview in 2019, Rochenkov said that he believed an array of nations that rated poorly on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index probably had corruption within their anti-doping agencies. These included Russia, Brazil, Thailand, Turkey, India, China, Romania, South Africa, and Greece. WADA labs in all of these places had been shut or suspended for corruption or irregularities at some point. Rojenkov also said in 2019 that Sergei Pukov, a former head of medicine at Russia's most successful club of the past decade, Zenit St. Petersburg, had very good practical experience of doping sports people, having also been a Russian Olympic doctor. Pukov was Zenit's doctor from 2006 to 2017. In 2014, the late Dutch footballer Fernando Rixon wrote about the club's practices in his autobiography, alleging that there were needles and syringes all over the place and players hooked up to drips. Rixon claimed Pukov offered him injections and he accepted them again and again and again. He wrote, I didn't have a clue what Dr. Pukov was putting in me, but man, it worked. I got an energy boost which was beyond imagination. Nobody ever tested positive. Pukov, I kept telling myself, must know the boundaries. After all, the man had been the official doctor of the Russian Olympic team. Zenit and Puknov have never commented on the allegations. Early in the noughties, two former players from another Russian club, Spartak Moscow, Vladislav Vashtyuk and Maxim Demenko, claimed there had been a systematic doping program there, though the club strongly denied the allegations. Around the same time, in his autobiography, Frenchman Marcel Desailly made similar claims about Marseille in the 1990s. And later, his teammate Jean-Jacques Edelet said he had agreed to take an illicit substance prior to the 1993 Champions League final. Marseille didn't respond to the accusation at the time. So what is clear is that nobody in football wants to be associated with doping. Not the players, their clubs, the national associations or the governing bodies at continental or world level. But what's also clear is that doping can enhance performance in football and appears to have been doing so for decades. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is where the Manchester United reporters revealed the truth behind the club's Jadon Sancho transfer fiasco, where the Tottenham reporters brought you news of Gareth Bale's return before anyone else, where the Chelsea reporters told us three days before his sacking that Frank Lampard was on the verge of losing his job. And you can try it now for free for 30 days. See the link in the description.